Hi. Uh, we'll be starting. I'm now point, talking to the Facebook group. We'll be starting in just a couple moments as I allow people to come in on Zoom. How you doing? Looking forward to hearing you. Okay, good. Yeah, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're going on here, gal. Okay. Wait to hear what you have to say. All right. You could feel free to jump in any time. Okay. Do you see that there's a source sheet? Is that are you able to see that? Okay, we're at 9.01, so I'll give it just another two to three minutes uh, to let people uh, to come on. Okay, let's uh, get started. Okay, we're going to get started. Hopefully, as new people come on, I will see them out of the corner of my eye and admit them as well. Um, I want to thank you all for joining me. I want to thank uh, uh, Yonatan, who's here in, in person. Um, and people should feel free. It's a sheer. So if you have questions as we go through, uh, by all means, uh, feel free to ask questions. The source sheet, hopefully, you should be able to see. Uh, it's being shared. Um, and if not, you can go to the website, uh, which also has uh, the, the, the source sheet there. Um, Basically, we're going to look at a question that has to do with um, politics um, and crime. Specifically, if someone is involved in uh, the political field and they want to run for election, if they've been convicted, what should the law do? Should the law allow that person to run for office? Um, or if they've already been elected, should the person allow that person to run for re-election? Or should the law step in? and say something about it. I have to begin by thanking uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Dr. David Flato for uh, encouraging, to, encouraging me to look at this question. Uh, he is a professor at Hebrew University's Law School and uh, he wanted to uh, have me look at this question for the final project that I'm uh, working on a degree there. Um, and he pointed out that different laws have different understandings of what we should do. The US law is different than, for example, the Israeli law. Um, so I want to thank him for encouraging me to look at it. Uh, I should point out that perhaps it's an interesting question. It's certainly a relevant question here in Israel. Uh, we have plenty of elections, and we have plenty of criminals involved in our elections. Uh, so it seems like it's always going to be relevant. Uh, hopefully it won't be, but uh, it seems, at least in the current times, it seems uh, relevant uh, to, to us. Um, but it might seem as an odd topic to talk about for a yard site shear. Um, in commemoration of my father, uh, Moshe Ben Shmuel, um, he was not a politician, uh, he was not corrupt, uh, and perhaps it seems therefore odd, in a sense, to uh, talk about it uh, uh, for in commemoration of his yard site and to think about him and to memorialize him. But I'll, but I'll say that there are a few reasons why I think it's appropriate. The first of all is my father had this very unique ability to really love uh, what uh, his children, his friends, his wife, really love what they were doing and get behind 
uh, what we were doing. And uh, so therefore, when I mentioned to him uh, that a few years back that I was interested in going back to school, just not for advance my career or anything like that, but just because I wanted to learn, uh, he uh, was very excited about it. And not only did he encourage me, but he insisted on paying for it as well. And he did this with all his children. We had many different interests, and he made our interest his interest and was very excited uh, to support them. Um, and so uh, I think it's uh, you know, appropriate uh, that um, uh, as I'm finishing the degree, uh, that uh, he is mentioned uh, at the very last uh, moment because it's in his merit uh, to be able to, uh, to do this. Uh, the second reason why I think it's uh, very relevant um, is because it actually reveals a lot about uh, who he was. We're going to talk about uh, politics and we're going to talk about crime, but we're also going to talk about um, very important qualities within Judaism. And I think he, as you'll see as the night goes on, emulates a lot of these qualities. And then finally, hopefully, we'll also be able to say something about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the spirit that, uh, the spirit of the times that we're in connected to this idea. So uh, without further ado, let me jump into the sources. And let me jump in by starting off by reiterating what I've said previously. This question, can a politician who's been convicted of a crime run for office, either for the first time or for re-election, um, different legal systems look at it differently. We're going to look at the US system, we're going to look at the Israeli system, and then we're going to look at halakha. Um, and you'll see that they all have slight nuances. The very beginning, if we start with the Israeli model, it's the very source, first source sheet that you see. This is the basic law. So basic law in Israel has a certain weighted uh, element to it. Um, the English translation is a little bit tortured, so I'll summarize it, but you can read it. It basically says that if someone is convicted of a crime and they serve uh, you know, prison for that crime, um, they are not allowed to actually run for office um, unless there's been seven years since the finishing of their sentence and then them running for election. Uh, that's the default position. You're not allowed to run if you've been convicted of a crime and, uh, except for seven years later. Except unless the judges determine that the crime in which you are involved in does not have what we call in Hebrew mishum kalon, does not have um, uh, what is uh, considered some type of moral disgrace to it. Somehow there are certain, and many people don't like this terminology of moral disgrace or moral turpitude, um, because it's not a legal term, it's a moral term. And so there apparently are some laws that you can break that are illegal but not immoral. Uh, but if it's a law that also makes you immoral, then you're not allowed to run for office unless the seven year uh, sort of cooling off period takes place. You'll see that the law also is connected to the same place where, for example, if someone's involved in terrorism, they're also not allowed to run for office unless there's a even longer period, a 14 year uh, period of time. So the people who instituted this law clearly saw that uh, we do not want criminals in office. Uh, they're going to be prohibited and barred from doing so. Um, uh, and especially if it has this concept of a mishum kalon, if it has uh, moral turpitude involved. Now go to the U.S. law. The U.S. law is number two. The U.S. law, in terms of the constitutional law, I'm talking about federal offices right now. So if you're running for the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Senate, but if you're talking about a local office, like running for mayor or running for uh, governor, um, sort of at the state level, there's a different legal system that's at play. But on the federal level, uh, you see, source number two says, no person shall be a representative who shall not have attained the age of 25. This is for the U.S. House of Representatives, for Congress. If you're running for Senate, there's a different age requirement. Um, has been a seven years a citizen, there's sources right there, has been a citizen of the United States and uh, has been an inhabitant of the state. Those are the requirements, these three conditions. Then there's a lot of case law that basically says if you meet these three conditions, you're the right age, you've been a citizen, and you live in the right place, you can run for office. There are there are, there's no other restrictions. It doesn't say anything about that you have to have a clean uh, criminal record. It doesn't say that you have to own land. It doesn't, that's it. This is the, the requirements of a certain education. Nothing. 
just those requirements. Uh, the subsequent case law, I brought only one, one example, but there's many examples. You see in source number three, this was a case where a state uh, wanted to prohibit uh, a certain individual uh, from running for Congress because they had been convicted of uh, a variety of uh, corruption crimes. Um, and they didn't want this person to run. And the US Supreme Court said, no, you could prevent this person to run for a state office, right, mayor, governor, things like that, but you can't prevent them from running uh, for a federal office. The Constitution, if you look at the, the other column, you'll see, it says the state does not have authority to add qualifications for federal offices, so therefore the fact of conviction, even for a felony offense, could not be used to keep a candidate off the ballot. Once a person meets the three basic constitutional qualifications, age, citizenship, and inhabitancy in the state when he's elected, that person is fully elected. Uh, I'll even go a step further. Even if you are in prison at the time of the election, according to US constitutional law, you can run for office. In fact, the first case of this took place, Matthew uh, Lyons, 1798. He was in prison in New Hampshire. Uh, he ran for office from prison. He had violated the Sedition Act. Um, uh, which was sort of a law that had to do with um, uh, the, in maintaining the integrity of the country as it's a brand new country and dealing with enemies, foreign, domestic. Uh, he violated it. He said some very not nice things and perhaps encouraged others to do not so nice, nice things against the President Adams at the time. Um, and he, uh, he was thrown in prison. He ran for office and he won. In fact, he doubled the vote of his next uh, likely person. He won. He had to be in prison uh, during the very beginning of the term. And then eventually he went uh, to Congress as an elected official. So the United States and Israel, clearly you see that there's a distinction. In the U.S. on the federal level, anyone's allowed to run. It doesn't matter whether or not you've been convicted or not. In Israel, the brakes step in. You are not allowed to run. At least there has to be a seven-year period after you're out of prison after your sentence has completed, even if you don't go to prison, but you have, let's say, uh, community service, after that is completed, seven years, and then you are allowed to run. Many people actually suggest that we should extend it, not just seven years, but even longer than 14 years, to be similar to the terrorism case. Question is why? Why the difference between the US law uh, and the Israeli law? What, what's the, the reasoning behind that? So I wanna just first look at the US, a little bit of history, a little bit of legal theory, then we'll look at Israel, and then we'll look at halakha. So the first historical piece of information that I think is interesting uh, relates to uh, the United States founders, many of whom were technically criminals. Many people have written that the US was basically an underground economy at the time, and many of the original protesters were protesting British tax law or British uh, additional British law that they felt imposed restrictions on their freedoms. And so, for example, John Hancock, his famous signature uh, on, the, on the Declaration of Independence, he was known as the king of colonial smugglers. And in fact, when the British confiscated his boat called the Liberty, um, he didn't become less popular as a criminal. In fact, that's what propelled him to become a political figure uh, in New England. Uh, and it was because and thanks to his given the nomenclature of being a criminal, that he actually won election. And in fact, there's a great number of early founders um, that were not only not embarrassed by being called criminals and violating the laws, but actually were quite proud of it. They brought just a quick example. You'll see the flag in source number four. This is the flag of the New England at the time of the Constitution. In fact, there was a flag very similar to this that George Washington put on all the ships um, that he commissioned. Uh, there were a whole series of flags that have this pine tree. What was the pine tree symbolic of? So before the Tea Party, right, the Tea Party Revolution, when the, the people were tired of paying the taxes on teas, a few years before that, there was a uh, revolution against the tax that was placed on pine trees. The British, of course, had these great uh, uh, armada of sailing, a sailing fleet, and in order to do that, you have to have masts on all of these boats. I feel bad that uh, uh, I, I'm picking on the British, Jonathan. I hope you, uh, you'll, you'll forgive me for this. Um, so, but the, the British taxed, and they actually went into the woods of property owners in New England, 
and they would walk through the forest, and whenever they found a, uh, a tree whose uh, um, giza, whose uh, uh, bar, uh, what, what's the word, Michaela? The, the root, the, the English, English. The trunk. The trunk, thank you, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> my Hebrew's not that good that I'm forgetting English, it's just that my English is that bad. So the trunk, if it was 24 inches in diameter, they would mark it and you were not, even though it was on your property, you were not allowed to cut it. And eventually the British actually did it only for, even for 12 uh, inches of diameter. You were not allowed to cut it. Um, and as soon as the British sort of uh, individual who was marking all these things left the property, part of the revolt was that the Americans would cut it down nevertheless and they would use it for their purposes, which is a violation of British law. And so to show their, their pride in their rebelliousness, they put that on the flag. And so that was one of the things that I think was motivating uh, the Americans at the time of the Constitution, saying that, first of all, not everyone who you think is a criminal is really a criminal. Maybe it's actually something quite patriotic. Um, there are other reasons, though, as well. Even after the British left, Thomas Jefferson famously wrote, you know, a little rebellion from time to time is a good thing. It's good for the government. And he was not talking about British laws. He was talking about rebellion against American laws. Uh, that you can't always trust that the legislators get it right. And if they get it wrong, you have to be prepared to protest that. And that might even involve some type of uh, criminal activity. Uh, another reason, I think, uh, certainly connected to Jefferson, he wanted to expand the number of people who were running for office, not limit it. Um, so, for example, again, going back to sort of the British history, uh, the parliament grew out sort of, of a consulting system between the king and, you know, the archbishop and certain wealthy landowners, but it wasn't democracy. It was trying to get them to fulfill his needs of collecting taxes and things along those lines. That was not the type of the government that the Americans wanted. They wanted to rebel against that, and so therefore they wanted to open it up as, as wide as, as possible. There's two other reasons that I think motivated uh, the Americans in the founding of this constitution. Um, and they both actually come back to that, that example I gave you of Matthew Lyons, this individual who ran uh, for Congress from prison and won in New Hampshire. So I mentioned that what he was accused of uh, was um, the Sedition Act, that he had written some things and he had published things against the president and against the policy and things along those lines, and that got him thrown into prison. It, this raises two, two questions. When there's an argument of who's right, right? Is Matthew Lyons a hero, a patriot, or a criminal? The question is who decides, right? Should it be the elite? Should it be courts? Should it be legislators? Or should it be the people? That's the first question that arises. And in this regard, Thomas Jefferson was very clear. Thomas Jefferson believed that the people should always decide, that there's a wisdom in trying to get as many people as possible to vote. Um, we call it today the wisdom of the crowds, right? That's very popular in, in business thought today, but the truth is it goes back many, many years. Aristotle actually introduces the concept, and he says it's, there's greater wisdom and accuracy the more people you can get involved uh, in a decision. In 1906, Francis uh, Galton actually introduced the concept more formally. He was in England. Now I'll give a positive thing. I, I shouldn't pick on England so much, but uh, uh, perhaps you know that he was in England in 1906. I think he was at like a, one of these state fairs, and there was a contest. There was an ox that was slaughtered, and you had to guess the weight. And there were, it was a contest. You would get money if you won, uh, and people put tickets, and they guessed the weight. And you would have thought that the people who were in the business, the professionals, you know, they would know more likely what the weight that was is important to them. But there were a lot of people who had no connection to this type of field who also guessed. And Galton decided to do an interesting experiment. He actually uh, collected all 800 guesses. And the total weight, I'm forgetting it now, but I think it was something like 1,198 pounds. And when he averaged out all of the guesses, it came to something like 1,197 pounds. In other words, the wisdom of the crowd was far closer in getting the right answer than even the person who gave the best possible answer all by himself. And so that was something that Jefferson believed in as well. He believed in, there's a wisdom of crowds, 
You let the people decide. Democracy produces the best results. It's not about elites who are experts in the fields, but rather let the people themselves decide. You see in source number six, this is Thomas Jefferson's position. I believe in the will of the majority. He's following Rousseau in this regard as the only sure guardian of the rights of man. Right? Don't leave it to elite. The people will guarantee that there are the rights. Perhaps even this may sometimes err, but its errors are honest, solitary, and short-lived. Let us then, my dear friends, forever bow down to the general reason of society. So with regards to Matt Lyons, Matthew Lyons, he'd say, let him run from prison. If he's not worthy, the people won't elect him. And indeed, that actually did take place. In 2008, there was a guy by the name of Ted Stevens who was a senator in Alaska. He was convicted of, I think, seven or more uh, charges of corruption. He ran for re-election, even though he was convicted. And the court said he has the right to run, based upon what everything we've just said, even though he was convicted of all these crimes. But the people didn't elect him. They saw a difference between what Lyons did in 1798, that he was a criminal, but they saw it sort of as a principled criminal, versus what Stevens did in 2008, which seemed to be only in his own personal self-interest. And the other issue that's raised here, of course, is the importance of free speech and freedom of the press, right? It's one of those sacrosanct things that Jefferson pushed for, getting Madison to write in the Bill of Rights, um, that it's very important. The government will usurp lots of powers, and so therefore there have to be certain things that we always protect, such as freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and therefore Matthew Lyons also was considered protect him, allow him to run. How do we know when someone speaks things that we don't like, if you don't let them run, that's stopping free speech. It's stopping the free speech of the person who's running, and it's also stopping the free speech of the people who elect him, because you're preventing that person from speaking as well. So I think that's part of what influenced the American position. What about the Israeli position? Uh, so, so here we have a different, obviously, historical reality. This law that I started with uh, originally passed in 1958. It did not actually include, it included the prohibition about terrorism, but it did not include the prohibition about criminals running for office. Um, it didn't mention it. And perhaps because, first of all, we had some of our own criminals. Menachem Begin, of course, uh, was uh, one of the most wanted men around. Um, but more than that, particularly on the issues of corruption, uh, there didn't seem to be Corruption in those days, at least the self-interested financial corruption that we're accustomed to seeing sometimes in, uh, in politics. Uh, there was an ethos, right? The country was founded by leaders of, who were kibbutznikim, the histadrut. Um, it was, the country was poor, consumerism. It helped that there wasn't much to consume also. In fact, if you do a quick Wikipedia search, there's almost no cases of political corruption of the sort that we're accustomed to until the 1980s. That, I think, is the first time there's a minister who's convicted. And then it goes up much higher in the 1990s and 2000. And it's just drawn up since then exponentially almost. Uh, and you see this a little bit. In the 1999 election, source number five, you'll see that uh, it lists what did people view as the most important issue in that election. This was the election, if you remember, between uh, Bibi and Barack. Okay, they're running 1999. Bibi was the prime minister. He's running for re-election. It was also at this time period um, that the Arye Derry case was finally coming to sort of uh, the head. It was, he had been already for many, many years, a lot of different legal wranglings, um, but the, the, the bribery and the whole series of charges, breach of trust, all these different things that took place um, with Arye Derry was taking place during this time period as well. And of course, Arye Derry's case brought in many other people. There's a famous uh, part of his case. He was being uh, brought, to, uh, brought to the courts for, for bribery. Um, but in the midst of this, there was also what was called the Baron affair, if you remember. Baron was, uh, the attorney general had had resigned, had retired, and Arye Derry said uh, to Netanyahu, I want an attorney general to be appointed who will be favorable for my case of bribery. And 
What did he give Bibi in return for this? Bibi, at this point in time, there was negotiations of the Hebron uh, redeployment, and Bibi didn't have the votes. And Arya Deri, who represented Shas, I think they had 10 seats, said, I can make it happen for you if you appoint someone who is favorable to me. Baron was considered favorable, and uh, Baron was appointed. The entire legal community went wild and crazy. They said, this can't be. He doesn't have the credentials. And he resigned almost within 24 hours or something like that. But there, too, was part of the whole corruption. And everyone felt the entire government um, had, had uh, credibility issues at this point in time. And so you see, terrorism, right? 1.3%. This was their number one issue. Um, Palestinian negotiations, 9.8%. But then it jumps Crime and corruption was 28.3%. This is in terms of the interest of the people and what was being reported in the news. Right? This was a burning issue. Um, also what happened, and perhaps because of this issue, what party uh, took a major splash in 1999? Do you remember this? Right? It was Shinui, uh, led by the father of Yair Lapid. Uh, right? Israel, you know, people say that Israel is not very environmental. Israel recycles everything, right? So today we have Yair Lapid. Back then we had Tommy Lapid, right? We, we're going to talk again about Derry. We're going to talk about it again Netanyahu. We conserve a lot. We're going to keep, keep the same names so it'll make life much easier. So with regards to uh, uh, Tommy Lapid, he introduced the uh, party Shinui. One of their number one concerns was corruption in politics. Um, and he exploded. He became the third largest party uh, based upon uh, on that on that platform, and so one of the things you see in Israeli society is there wasn't this law, and then in the year 2000 it finally becomes the law. What was the exact details of how it happened? So she knew he was pushing for it in 1999, but they weren't successful. Why? Because Shas, even without Ari Derry, who had been convicted, Shas still had power, and they refused to, and they were in the government, Barack's government and they refused to allow him allow the law to be passed. In 2000, however, Barack moved forward with his peace negotiations, so much so that Shas eventually dropped out of the government, and the next day after Shas is out of the government, Shinui passed this law, second and third readings, um, and it became the, the law. Very much targeted at Arye Derry that once he finishes his serving the sentence, he would not be allowed to run so quickly again. So that took place. That's sort of the Israeli history of how this law was passed. And part of it is the great increase in corruption um, that took place, and therefore it became sort of necessary. I should point out sort of parenthetically, in the U.S., where you don't have the Constitution applying, meaning in those state cases, if you look at state laws, there was also an increase in corruption, and therefore there was also an increase in state laws that prohibited uh, politicians from running for office uh, for one reason or the other. But there's also, I think, some principled issues. Um, for example, uh, we spoke a little bit about Israel's socialist roots. Even when the socialism has been moved aside a little bit, the collectivism of Israel is much stronger here than what takes place in the US. The, the respect of the individual or the celebration of the individual very often is second to the celebration of the communal or the national. Eliakim Rubinstein, who is a former Supreme Court justice, he lives in our neighborhood. Uh, I always like to think of, talk about him as being sort of one of the tzaddikim of this neighborhood. I, when I walk out, my, uh, walk out my house, I'll sometimes see him across the street and he's picking up garbage. And I once asked him, he said, you know, what are you doing? You're picking up litter. He says, I learned this from my mother. She always used to pick up litter. No matter how much litter was on the, the, the floor, she always would pick it up. And she learned it in turn from the Chafetz Chaim. So it's one of the things that he says, I want to continue in the, the ways of my mother, that he always picks up litter uh, wherever he goes. So Eliakim Rubenstein wrote an interesting article comparing the Declaration of Independence for the United States and the Israeli Declaration of Independence. And he points out that when it talks about rights in the American form, it's always about individual rights, right? The freedom of speech is an individual right. When it speaks about the uh, 
Israeli rights, it's national rights. The national right of the Jewish people to return to their land. The national right of the Jewish people to be independent. It's national, it's a collective element. And so therefore, when it comes to issues that affect the nation, and there's that balancing, which, is more, which should take precedence? The, the individual's needs for free speech, for electing who they want to elect, or the nation's needs to protect itself, Israel balances more towards the national, the, the collective. You see it with freedom of the press very clearly. We still have a censor, right? In the United States, there's the famous case, uh, the Pentagon Papers, where the government did not want the New York Times to publish certain uh, information that they thought would hurt their war effort uh, in Vietnam, and the court rejected it. it. said the freedom of the press, even if it hurts the nation. Where in Israel, we have a censor that stops the press from reporting things if it might challenge the success of the government's waging a particular war. Or there's other examples as well. We have laws against uh, offending certain religions, even though that violates freedom of the press because the fabric of Israeli society can be torn apart because of divisions in religion, divisions in economic. So we have to maintain that fabric. And so Israel has said, we're going to favor the needs of the whole country, the collective, over even individual rights. So I think that's partly what influenced the Israeli uh, decision in this regard. There's one other element you'll see. I put source number seven, um, Edmund Burke. Jefferson loved, as I told you, the people. They should decide. There's a great wisdom in the people. Edmund Burke, a uh, famous British legislator, he was elected by the people of Bristol, who assumed that now that they've elected him, he'll serve their needs. And he gives them a famous speech where it says, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what I think is best, even if it's against your interests. And he writes famously, a voter should expect from me my unbiased opinion, mature judgment, enlightened consciousness. That's what I'm duty bound, not to sacrifice these things to you, to any man. Your representative owes you, not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices to your opinion. This is a concept of trustee representation, that we believe in a certain elite, that they can represent us best, they'll come to the better decisions than just returning to the people as well. And I would say that Israel, to a certain extent, adopted a more trustee model of representation than Jeffersonian model of pure democracy. Right? We have the party system. Right? You don't elect an individual. Right? You elect a party, and the party sort of chooses who we think are the best people. I'm not necessarily saying it the, produces the right results, but Israel seems to always have an elite, and the elite make more of the decisions than the people. There's a more of trust already from the beginning. Right? The, the first government was a continuation of the Jewish agency where the heads of other organizations Right? We felt those people were better representative. Uh, it's also caused problems in Israeli society that it doesn't have as much respect uh, for the people. But I think that's another uh, piece of the puzzle. Um, there's one other thing I'd like to mention about the Israeli uh, cultural uh, influence, and then we're going to look at halakha. So the, the I said there wasn't a lot of corruption. In the, from 1958 until really the 1980s and 1990s, and the society became wealthier. Um, maybe that's what influenced the mores change. We became more open to these things. But I would say also that took place as a change of perception of what is corruption. You walk into a cab. What is the first thing a taxi driver? Those of you who are now overseas, this definitely happens to you if you have an English or American accent when you ask the taxi driver to where you're going to go. What's the first thing the taxi driver says to you? The what? The meter's not working. Ah, thank you. The meter is not working. I'm so sorry that I can't put it on the meter. I'll do it for this amount of price. What is he really doing? He's evading taxes, right? And it happens to be that based upon this idea, someone has done research of little ways that sort of Israeli society evade taxes, that it's one of the biggest countries in evading taxes. But it was also acceptable for a very long period of time. And in fact, there were many things that other people would call corruption, 
We're here for a whole series of different reasons. Maybe it's the sense of community. Maybe it's the, the, the challenges from the outside. What some people might call corruption actually was just a way of life. I gave you a quick uh, cartoon in source number nine. This was the Cherut complaining about the corruption of David Ben-Gurion. Um, you'll see it says, buy yourself kanev vitamin protexia, pay, right? Make sure you get protexia. That's what you, why should you vote for? Or why was Ben-Gurion, what was he arguing uh, in the eyes of Cherut? You should vote for me because I will give you a job. Uh, many people call this not protexia, but corruptexia, right? Because there are certain acceptable positions. Protexia basically is corruption. You'll get a job and will bypass some of the processes normally in order to get that job because I know who you are. Or there were people who would go to immigrant camps and say, if you vote for me, your leader will get a job, right? That's point blank bribery. I'll give you a job if you vote for me, the masses. But it was understood that's how things were done in Israeli society in those early years, and maybe it had to be done that way. But it's hard to say that there was corruption if people didn't perceive it as such. In the 1980s, however, as Israel became more westernized and more open to what was going on in the world, these perceptions also changed. And perhaps a turning point is the 1988 law of the ombudsman who says we have to root out all forms of corruption, even the ones that previously we have accepted. And so perhaps that also is part of the, the, the puzzle of why this law came uh, when, it, when it came. So those are a couple of the influences, I think, that explains the US position and explains the Israeli position. Um, and you could see them both, uh, I think, quite well in the first case that came up regarding this law here in Israel in 2003 uh, with someone, again, we're recycling the names, Moshe Feiglin. Moshe Feiglin wanted to run uh, in a particular political party. He was listed uh, as one of their candidates um, and he was disqualified because he never got a previous conviction. If you remember, Moshe Feiglin came to somewhat uh, renown because he used to block all the roads Remember, during Oslo, he got out and he would protest and he encouraged others to protest and he blocked traffic, which was against the law, a uh, breach of the peace. Um, he encouraged people to ignore laws with regards to certain of the yeshuvim, the settlements. Uh, uh, he, also, he was very careful always to say, do not attack police, do not do anything like that, but civil disobedience. And he was arrested and convicted of that. When he went to run for office, he never asked for his particular crime to be declared one without moral turpitude. And so therefore, he was disqualified based upon this law. And the two opinions that dominated the decision, there was a majority opinion and a minority opinion. The minority opinion was written by Justice Levy. The minority opinion is very Americanized. If you look at in source number 10, based upon this case, he says, he speaks about freedom of speech, right? That's American. He says, it should be granted to those even though we disagree. And how can you say that there's moral turpitude? Right? He got up. In his mind, I think he's perhaps a Matthew Lyon type of case. Even if you disagree with what he was saying, he was not corrupt. He was honest. I want to stop the Oslo Accords. Right? He was frank. Uh, he wasn't trying to hide anything. He wasn't trying to, right, he was trying to change law. Regarding moral turpitude, this is about six lines down, he dismisses his colleagues' concern that Fagelin's incitement was such a threat to democracy that it required additional enactments of moral turpitude. I find it difficult to understand how there is dishonor in the uh, offense of incitement, meaning he was convicted of incitement and it's wrong, and he was punished for that. What this law says, however, is you need to have an additional punishment in addition to whatever the law says is problematic, and that's that this person can't enter and become part of the leadership of the, the government. Under these circumstances, should we see the petitioner as one who was then or now set upon destroying the foundations of democracy? Obviously, in Levy's opinion, he says no, but he's the minority. The majority opinion held that they thought Fagelin was a threat to democracy, that democracy in Israel is 
too weak, it's too fragile to be able to have people, you know, breaching trust and, and incitement and all these other things. And they said, therefore, there is moral turpitude in his, in his actions. It challenges the very foundations of our democracy, which is to destroy those things that keep us together. There's the collective. It's also against the speech issue, right? The needs of the country take precedence over the needs of the individual. There is no Bill of Rights in the same regard. And so therefore, the opinion uh, sided uh, the majority uh, was, uh, was against him and he was not allowed to run at that point in time. Right? Seven years have passed now. He runs again much, much later. What I'd like to do now is turn to halakha. We've looked at the American position. We've looked at the Israeli position. We've looked at a case, the Fagelin case, that sort of has both the American and the Israeli sort of contrasting one another. And I'd like to ask the question, what would halakha say about this type of case? What would it say about the dairy case? Um, and what I'd like to argue is that halakha actually would distinguish between these two types of cases. Um, but more importantly than what it says about sort of this public political issue is what the halakha teaches us about how we relate to not just our society, but to individuals within our society, very much so as we approach uh, Rosh Hashanah and, and, and Yom Kippur. So there's a lot of different ways we could look at this issue from a halakhic point of view. Um, the idea of removing a political leader certainly exists in Jewish thought, right? We have a king, but the very first king, Shaul, is actually removed by Shmuel, right? Because he wasn't fulfilling his task. Um, you have the prophets condemn the second king, David HaMelech. So you have this concept, we also have in the Dvarim, which says a king has to be limited, he has to write his own Torah, he's not allowed to do whatever he wants. Right, so we already have this principle of political leaders are there to serve God and serve the people, not the other way around, and they can be removed if they violate that. So that was one way we could have looked at this question. We could also look at the question, for example, with the Sanhedrin, which has a form of democracy, but it's a trustee model. It's the elite. You can only get in the Sanhedrin if you have a certain amount of Torah knowledge. So there's democracy within it, but it's limited in order to get into that. So we could have looked at it this way, but I want to look at it from a different perspective, connected to the concept of, of tshuva. Right? Tshuva is presumably available for everyone. If it's available for us as individuals, it should also be available for a politician. Someone is involved in crime. Can they do tshuva for that crime and return to their position? So let's look at a few halakhic ideas, and then we'll look at one more court case, or one, one and a half more court cases. So if you look at source number 11, in Bava Metzia, you'll see it says as follows. There's this concept of onat dvarim, that you can oppress someone with words. And the Mishnah says, what is one of the examples of oppressing a person with words? Im haya baal tshuva lo yomar lo zechor ma'asecha harishonim. If a person had sinned and now has done tshuva, has repented over that sin, you are not allowed to remind them of their previous sins. If you look at the next source, 12, Kedushin, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he says, Afidu Rasha Gamor, even a completely wicked person, Kol Yamav, all the days of his life he was wicked, Vaseh Tshuva Bachrona, but at the very end of his life he does Tshuva, Ein Maskirim Lo Shuv Rasha, you are not allowed to remind him of his wickedness. Even though the vast majority of his life is as a wicked person, you're not allowed to remind him beginning to see that there's an obligation of tshuva, not just for the individual who's doing tshuva, who's repenting, but also the people around him. So much so, you'll see in source number 13, Rabbeinu Gershom, so this is much later than the Talmud, kol maskir lechoseh tshuva, everyone who reminds, anyone who reminds a, a person who's done tshuva, at ma'asav rishonim, his earlier actions, yebinidui, he should be placed in excommunication. Right? In other words, it's not just the individual doing tshuva that has a responsibility, but there's a flip side of that coin. There's also this community, the society. The person who's in the wrong is not the person who sinned and then did tshuva, but the person who reminds the sinner that they were once a sinner. You see, Judaism starts off 
Bereshit bara, according to Rashi, of God wanting to create a world based on din. And Rashi says then, but the world couldn't be sustained in, in justice alone. There has to be mercy. We have it on Yom Kippur as well. Right? It says God extends a hand to the poshim, and God prefers that the, the poshim do tshuva rather than they die. God wants them to come in and wants to extend mercy to them. And part of our obligation in emulating God's actions is to also extend that mercy to, to the sinners. Uh, if you look at the next source, 14. The Gemara and Sota. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Mishun Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Mipnei ma tikun tefilat belachash. I'll just give a couple examples outside of the world of crime. Why, when we pray, we pray silently. Right? There's many ways we could have prayed. We could have prayed and screamed and shouted. We do some of that, right? With slichot. But our regular tefilot, our regular prayers, why is it done always silently? Shelo de bayesh et ovre avera. Because if you did it out loud, you would have to confess your sins. And when you confess your sins, that would be embarrassing to you and other people would hear it. And so therefore, in order to allow the sinner to feel comfortable in synagogue, we all pray silently. So you have no idea what they're saying. You have no idea what sins they may have been uh, engaged in. Um, Continuing that idea. And this is very much related to uh, the actual Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur experience we're going to have this year, right? When we dive in this year, this building usually can hold 240, 250 people. We're going to have 60 people at a time because we're going to have to have this huge distance and gap between everyone. There has to be this huge gap. You know what? That's how it originally was done, believe it or not, though. But not because of a physical plague, but a spiritual plague. The, the Mishnah in Pirkei Avot speaks about 10 miracles that existed uh, in the time of the Beit HaMikdash. The one that interests me is the sixth line down. After the comma, you'll see it says, Omdin Tzfufim. When people would stand in the Beit HaMikdash area, they were Tzfufim. They were crowded amongst one another. They were like too close. But when they bowed, Mishtachavim, Rivachim. But when they bowed down, all of a sudden there was space between them. That was a miracle. The Miri says, what was the, what was the motivation? Why did you need space to bow down? Like, why not have space all the time? He says as follows. When they stood, they were close together, but when they bowed down, they were, had space in between them, four amot between them. There was four amot between them, right? It's like what we have today, two meters between all the different uh, people who are davening. Why? There was this distance between them, a space between them. So that you wouldn't hear. What do you do when you bow down? You confess your sins. And you don't want people hearing you confessing your sins. But we have to create an environment where people feel comfortable to confess their sins. We have to help them in the process of tshuva. So we create a, a Beit HaMikdash experience in which they can be in fact, comfortable. This concern on a spiritual level comes down to a very practical, physical level uh, in uh, the Gemara. Well, I brought the source from the Rambam, but it appears first in uh, the Gemara, I believe in Kedushin. It might be in Gittin. I think it's Gittin. The Rambam in Hilchot Gezela. Kola gozel chayev lachzir gzela atzma. Anytime you steal from something from someone else, you have to return the actual item that you stole, okay? The physical item, not the, the monetary equivalent, the actual item that you stole. Shenemar, because it says in the Torah, et asher gazal. You have to return that which you specifically stole. A filu, but what happens in a case where you stole a beam from a person's house? And let's say it's the middle beam. You stole that, and you now built it in your house, and it's in the middle of your house. So what's the halacha? The, the Torah law is, you have to take that beam out of the middle of your house, even if it means the whole house is going to collapse, and return it to the individual. However, the rabbis said, they tiknu, they changed the law. The dina Torah is, you destroy the entire house to get that beam. 
and you return the beam to its owner. But the rabbis decreed, the, the takana of those who are returning. They're not talking about returning the, the beam. They're talking about those who are doing tshuva. Takanat hashavim noten et You give money instead. In other words, and the commentaries go on to say, what was the Rambam describing? What was the Talmud describing? That you have to make tshuva easier. Right? If you take their beam and destroy their house, it makes tshuva much more difficult. You may say that's a good thing. Make it as hard as possible, because then it really shows that they did tshuva. The rabbis didn't say that. The rabbis say, you try to make tshuva as easy as possible. You try to bring the person back into society. And so you don't want to destroy their house. You want to make it easier for them. This exact phrase, by the way, takanat hashavim, exists in Israeli law. There's a 1981 law called takanat hashavim, allowing people, and it has to do with prisoners, and criminals to return to society in an easier way. So for example, there's a registry of, when people are involved in a crime, there's a registry of all people who are involved in crimes. But not everyone's allowed to see that. What this law says is, if you're just a typical employer, you're not allowed to see whether or not a person you're hiring is convicted of a crime or not. Now you may think, I should have the right to see if the person's involved in a crime or not, and there are some crimes yet, yes, you can know. But by and large, unless you're in the police or certain sensitive uh, uh, professions, you're not allowed to know unless you get a special permission to look at this registry because we want people to be rehabilitated. We want them to be able to re-enter society. And if you always attach the stigma on the criminal, he won't be able to return to society. We have to be part of the process of rehabilitation. Part of that law also says after a certain period of time, they can have their name completely expunged from that list. Even the police can't see for the same idea, we want to sort of encourage people who want to do tshuva to come back into society. And there, there's a lot of very positive elements to this. Israel's is also working now in prisons, for example, to help educate prisoners. If there's a proof that shows that, that if prisoners get their high school diploma while in prison that they didn't get previously. By the way, if you do that in Israeli prisons, it doesn't say that you got a, a high school equivalency from the prison. It says it's from the Ministry of Education. We don't want you to know that you got it in prison. But there's a recidivism rate of 13% less. That also saves a tremendous amount of money. The RAND Corporation did a study that shows for every dollar you invest in rehabilitation and education to prisoners, it's a $5 savings in terms of whether or not there's a recidivism rate and bring them back in. That's part of the Jewish understanding. We want people to do tshuva. So if that's part of the idea, this concept of mercy, you might think, therefore, that if a person does the crime, they fulfill their obligation, we want them then to be able to return to their previous positions. And that does exist in many, many cases. If you look at source number 15, this is a case in 1967. I spoke about taxis before. So in 1967, there was a taxi driver who apparently did something inappropriate uh, with one of his passengers and they imprisoned the person for a little bit. They didn't let him get off where they wanted to get off. And they, anyway, they took away his license uh, for a certain period of time. And then they wanted to take away his license forever. They banned him from being a taxi driver, I think, three or four years. But there was an argument that he should not ever be able to return to his license. And the Justice Cone writes, since the judgment was handed down, nothing has occurred to give rise to any fear that he would resume his past deviations. That means that the respondent cannot, and in fact does not, base his fear on anything other than the fact that four years ago the petitioner committed offenses of which he was convicted for and which he was punished. I'm not saying that such a conviction cannot serve as a basis for reasonable fears that the offender may return to his old ways, possibly. Subsequent facts or circumstances might be revealed to justify these fears. But right now, you can't presume, the presumption is not that the person is guilty and they'll always be guilty. Rather, the presumption is if they've served their time, they are now, in fact, innocent. And he quotes from the Gemara in Makot. It says, after a person would get their lashes, um, lest thy brother shall be dishonored in their eyes, means that after he's undergone his flogging, he's still now your brother in all other ways. And so therefore, once a person received their punishment, they re-entered society as your brother. Once he's served his time, 
you allow them back in. There's another case uh, decided number 16 by a Justice Yitzhak Kister, who I think is the only Haredi uh, Supreme Court Justice, um, born in 1905, he became Supreme Court Justice in 1965, he was there for 10 years. He had a case of a lawyer who forged documents. Not a good thing for a lawyer to do. They, he was thrown out, the, the group of uh, lawyers, the bar, threw him out um, and penalized him for five years. He says, you cannot be a lawyer anymore. The National Tribunal got in and says, he can never be a lawyer. Right? Five years is not enough punishment. He can never, ever again become a lawyer. He's not allowed to be reinstated. This is what Judge, Justice uh, Kister wrote. The door is not to be bolted in the face of those who repent sincerely and honestly. Indeed, in the absence of any weighty reasons to the contrary, restoration to their previous way of life, their occupation and post, should be facilitated for the penitent. In other words, a person violates the law, violates certain standards, you can remove them. But there has to be a limit, and eventually you have to return them to their position. Unless, he says, there's some special circumstances. So now we move to our cases, our, our Knesset members, part of these special cases. So if you look at source number 18, the first example he gives is with the Ira Miklat, right? The person who accidentally kills another individual, he runs to a, uh, a city of refuge, and then he returns home, right? After the high priest dies, he's allowed to return home. And the Rambam writes, he has now done his time in exile. He's returned home, and he has gained atonement. So he's totally clean. However, the second paragraph, although the killer has gained atonement, he should never return to a position of authority that he previously held. Instead, he should be diminished in stature for his entire life because of the great calamity he has caused. In other words, we want to return people to their previous status. But if their crime is so horrendous, in this case, taking another life, we just can't go that far. It's just the loss of life, the destruction of Tzelem Elohim, someone created in the image of God. It just, that, it can be forgiven and a person has atonement, but they can't be elevated. Because when you elevate a person, you're looking to that person for inspiration and you can't get past the fact that this person has killed another individual. So it's because they want a certain position and because they've engaged in a certain crime. He gives another example, which I think is also relevant for us. Source number 19. Whenever a person sins and is lashed, he returns to his original state of acceptability, as implied by the verse, and your brother shall be degrade, not be degraded before your eyes. Right? You've received your punishment, you, you, you're done, and now you can return to anything. You can become that taxi driver, you can become that lawyer again. If you're a high priest, you can also, you get lashes, you can also return. If you're the leader of a ritual role, you can also return. However, if we're now talking about the last paragraph on that page, when by contrast the head of the academy transgresses, this is the Nasi, or the Av of the Sanhedrin, the leader of the Sanhedrin, he's given lashes in the presence of the court of three, but he does not return to his position as being the Nasi. If he has a political position, an educational position, he's, a, he's the leader. There's a different standard for leaders. He is not reinstated even as one of the judges of the Sanhedrin. The rationale is that we ascend higher in matters of holiness and do not descend. In other words, there are certain positions that a, that a person, even if we forgive them, even if they welcome them back into society and we want those prisoners to get jobs and everything like that, but there are certain things you can't elevate them back to. And if they are the head of the Sanhedrin, that's one of those positions. And the question is, is that parallel to a member of Knesset or something along those lines? Um, Kister then gives four reasons for this. I just want to briefly uh, say those four and then four other reasons that I found in the Rambam. These eight additional ideas, I think, help us understand what is the Jewish law perspective on someone who wants to return to a high office, whether or not it makes sense for them to return or not from a Jewish lawyer point of view. So just very briefly, I am cognizant of the time. I will probably be about another 10 minutes. 
So Kister says the reasons for this ruling, meaning we return everyone, except if they want to become the Nasi, the head of the Sanhedrin, that's a different story. He says, first of all, it's for his own benefit. His, co- his colleagues will despise him. When a person engages in corruption, he lowers the level of esteem that his colleagues are held. And if a member of Knesset is corrupt and it's acceptable, so then everyone looks at the entire Knesset as corrupt. And so therefore, people who are trying to be honest in the Knesset will look at this person with disgrace, despise them, won't want to work with them. It creates a problem. You can't then be successful in the Knesset in this regard. That's the first answer he suggests. Second, there's a fear that he may seek revenge on those who condemned him. Very often these people have power. If this person is a minister in the government and he can control who's going to prosecute him, he can control who's going to be the attorney general, he can have people fired, he can control budgets to people who will support him, giving money to some people and not giving money to others, not on the basis of the needs, but on the basis of this individual's needs. So that becomes a very serious problem. So you can't return him to a position where he has all this power because it will help him actually not do tshuva and repentance. There's an element of chilul Hashem. Right? This person could represent God. Certainly if a person is religious right, and he's done something terrible, people hold not only this individual, but God responsible, religion responsible, Judaism responsible. And in a society like ours where we are trying to maintain a certain balance and respect for people of different views. This could inflame and tear apart the, the, the fragility of that society. I'd point out, for example, uh, if you look at source number 21, this is a question was asked of the Rambam. He was asked about a ritual slaughter who was considered to be an excellent shochet in terms of producing a ready and abundant supply of highly kosher meat, but was unfortunately also a thief. Was it permissible to leave him in his position? They wanted to leave him in his position, the community, because he was able to produce good kosher meat, but he was also a thief. So the Rambam says, absolutely not. He's not allowed to remain a shochet, because one of the things that the nations of the world know about the Jewish people is that Jews will only appoint the most ethically fit individuals to be their ritual slaughterers, certainly not criminals. He crucially expanded on this ruling by noting, the perception is a matter of great pride for Jews. Thus, if we permit this individual to remain and all know that he's a thief, this will be a chilul Hashem, the desecration of God's name. It will give a bad name to Judaism. And therefore, it does not matter even if he repents. In terms of desecrating Judaism, the stigma of him being known as a thief by others has already attached. So here too, right, if a person is known to be corrupt, and they're a leader of the Jewish people, right? We should aspire, says the Rambam, to have only the most ethically fit people to be our leaders. It shines poorly not just on him, but on all of us if we allow this person to remain in that position. That's the third of Kister's arguments. The fourth, he says, the role of a president is to educate and guide. Well, it's very hard to educate and guide people and inspire people if you're known to be a crook. It just doesn't work that way. The Rambam gives four additional issues. He says a lot of it has to do with the greatness of the sin. If the sin is very great, then you have to have additional punishments, right? So we could understand if, if the sin is, you know, a parking ticket, maybe we don't have to have an additional uh, uh, prohibition, a additional uh, thing that you can't run for office for seven years. As someone spoken by someone who uh, has gotten parking tickets. Um, but if, on the other hand, it's a very serious thing, like undermining the trust in the entire uh, legal and democratic system, so then maybe that's a, that's a different standard. The Rambam says also, if the crime is done very frequently, you may have to have a higher standard, a higher level of punishment. If the crime, I'm in number 20C, the amount of temptation is for a particularly tempting crime, you have to have a higher level of punishment. If... Uh, if it's done in secret, that's the nature of the bribery, right? It has to be done in secret. And if the person's in power can control that no one will find out about it, that also calls for extra prohibition. I, I started to say that these eight standards would help us sort of, I think, 
uh, go in between the needle to make a distinction between, let's say, the Feiglin case and the Derry case. I mean, Feiglin was very upfront. He told everyone what he's doing. He's protesting against Oslo. He was not trying to hide it, right? The Rambam's last concern. Um, he was not uh, uh, necessarily at the frequency of the crime. It's during Oslo courts. It may not apply anything further. Um, was he seeking revenge on people if he came to power? He didn't necessarily have that power, but someone who's a minister, controlled budgets, perhaps could be so. And I think when you look at these eight different cases, you may come to different conclusions uh, for these two different types of cases. I, I want to conclude with two or three more things. First of all, I want to look at the continuation of the Rambam's tshuva, number 21, the last paragraph, um, and then try to connect what I've spoken about uh, a little bit to uh, lessons that I've learned from, from my, my father. It should be noted that Maimonides does offer some wiggle room. This is the case, if you remember, about the shochet, the slaughterer, who was a thief, but a great slaughterer, a great shochet. It should be noted that Maimonides does offer some wiggle room in his refusal to ever allow this individual to return to his previous position, suggesting that if he could conclusively prove that he's truly a changed individual, and, the, and not just that he's changed, but, but that his change is known, and that becomes what attaches to his name, that change, that improvement. And the perception of his change as a result, then perhaps he might be able to rectify the situation. What might be the case? And then the Rambam gives, he says, if he goes way above and beyond, and not only is he no longer a criminal, but he becomes known as this incredibly ethical individual, that he returns lost objects even when there's no sign, uh, which is not an obligation. When he loses money on his you know, there's a meat that it's questionable whether or not it's kosher or not. And he knows that it is not kosher, but no one else would know. And he reveals, and he says that, and he loses a big amount of money in that regard. And gives other examples where he goes above and beyond and his, his entire nature becomes this ethical superhero, so to speak. Then he can change the, the reality of the situation. And so I think, taken all together, there's a few points here. There, there, I talked a lot about sort of politics and public life. Um, and I think there's advice here of how we should look. The Rambam would say we want our leaders to reflect the highest ideals of Judaism. And if we don't hold them to account, then no one else will. So we have to be very careful about the leaders we place that they should have this high ethical standard. But... And, and I would suggest what, what the Rambam is saying here is also what Kister might argue as well. The seven-year uh, cooling-off period is not just a cooling-off period. The real meaning behind that law, I would suggest, is if you're not allowed to be engaged in politics for seven years, what are you going to do with that time? Right? Time passes on regardless. It moves on regardless. But we can transform that time. And so I think that's partly what we would expect of anyone we should open our, our, our doors to allow a person to return, but we have to also expect something from them on that level. But that's the public. The reason why I related to this idea, these ideas here, is on the personal. Right? We're in the time of, uh, of tshuva, we're in the time of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and we see that mercy is a big part of that. We're only allowed to ask for forgiveness of God because we also are prepared to give forgiveness. And part of tshuva, first of all, we see that anyone can do tshuva. Right? Even the, the criminal, there's a mitzvah to, to, for that person to do tshuva. God wants them to, he may not be able to return to the highest level, but he still is able to return to have a good relationship with God and society. But it's not just that. It's not just dependent upon the person trying to do the tshuva. It's also dependent upon us, that we have to help them. We have to help pave the, the way for them to be able to, to do so. That's part of our obligation during this time period as well. As I mentioned, I thought this year reveals a few things about, about my dad. Um, one of them is, uh, he was an incredibly ethical individual. Um, instinctively, he knew what was right and, and it hurt him. You could see that it bothered him uh, when someone, especially publicly, would do something uh, unethical. And he was prepared, even when it cost him, and it did in a couple of instances, uh, to make sure that he was always very careful and filled with integrity. Um, as I said, even when 
it, it, it cost him. He was a Jewish professional, um, and there was an instance once where uh, there was a way of getting out to pay a, uh, a loan um, to a non-Jewish bank. Um, it was permitted. You could file for bankruptcy. And he says, but we can't do that, because how will the non-Jews view the Jewish community? We should fulfill our obligations, even if it means we have to struggle much more so. Um, and many of the people didn't like that idea because they wanted to get rid of the debt, but he felt that he should fulfill the debt. Um, so that was one of the things that he was always very, very important to him, always to be an ethical uh, individual. But also the other lesson of this year, I think, is to see the good in people. Uh, even those who have tried to convince you that they don't have uh, such goodness. Um, he's very much like Rabbi Nachman. Rabbi Nachman used to say that every person has something good in them. Even the criminals have something good in them. And what you have to do is you have to sort of focus on that good and maybe bring out more good as a result of that. And that's something my father always was able to do. He was always able to see the good in people. Um, so maybe he was a little naive in some regards, but he was able, always able to see the good. And if you could have a relationship with them, he was actually able to bring out that good and make the people better as a result of seeing the good that was uh, uh, innate with them. And, and I think that's part of the, the challenge of this time as well. It's not only to work on ourselves, uh, but to work on ourselves how we see others and to be able to see the good in other people um, and to then take advantage of that good that we see in other people to actually make them become better. And as we do that, we ourselves will become much better as well. Thank you for uh, joining me tonight. And uh, I look forward to spending time with as many of you as possible as we enter into the Yamin Narim together. Have a good night. I should open up for questions. If anyone has questions, wants to stay around, I don't mean to, to limit you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. This is great. Okay, thanks. Wonderful. All of the. Abba. Abba. Hello. Mm. I'll see you soon. Mm. You waited patiently. Very patiently. <laughs> All right. I'm going to turn you off, though. <laughs>